You don't have to have a lot of F and MF and all of these cuss words before you start saying them yourselves. And I'm not sitting here saying that you all are doing this, but what I am saying is that we have to get to the realization that what we are putting in us is just as important as what we're saying here this morning. Yeah. It's what we're putting out. We have to understand the importance that what goes in us will ultimately come out. We would never go eat food if we realized that it was going to make us sick and make us vomit right in front of other people. We do it not knowingly, but whenever we go and we get some bad food that is spoiled, that is outdated, that causes us to be sick, we can be in the midst of many, many great people and preachers, but once that stomach starts rumbling and the vomit starts spewing, everybody there is going to see it. Understand it doesn't take much of the bad to make you vomit in front of everyone. And here's where we stand as a church. We have to understand that whenever we are being uh, in front of the city, that we have to be prepared. Not just knowledgeable, not just book knowledge, not just Bible verses memorized, not just able to quote things, but also able to live a holy life in front of the community as well. So what's on the inside of us births out of us. And that thing directly affects the nation. We're getting back to the nation. So what is a nation? I defined it for you earlier, but in the context of Restoration Church in Sealy, Texas, what is the nation? The nation is Sealy, Texas. The nation is right here where we are at. The nation is not the United States of America. The nation is not the, 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 the northern continent of the United States. No, this is the nation where we are standing right here and right now. The surrounding areas of Sealy, Texas and Sealy, Texas itself is the nation in which we are called to affect. It is essential that we understand this because so many pastors and so many churches and so many ministries want to go out and have a global ministry. They want to go out and they want to have a nationwide ministry. And I'm not against God using us on a global scale or a national scale, but I have come to tell you that if we are only interested in affecting those in whom we will never meet or see, then we are literally making the ones directly in front of us starve. We have to be able to feed the nation in which God has planted us into. We have to understand the importance that if we, uh, if we only try to affect the United States or the entire world, that we will leave the people of Sealy, Texas to starve and fend for themselves. We have to get back to the place to where we are operating in an ecclesiastics type of church, ecclesia where the local church body is affecting the local people. And if God begins to expand it, that's beautiful and that's fine. But the local ministry has to keep on burning hot. Because the people in this nation, in this city are worth it. The people in this area are worth it. When we went outside these four walls and they heard us preaching from their houses and from their cars, when they heard us singing, that is what we are called to do. And here's what I'm going to tell you. We're doing this every three months from here forward. Amen. Now once a year. We're not going to do three nights every three months, but we're going to do one night every three months. And we're going to go wherever God leads us to go. We might go in some dangerous areas. We might go in some drug-ridden areas. We might go to the Walmart parking lot and put up a trailer and get in that parking lot and begin to preach and sing. Wherever God leads us, because we are called to affect this nation. This nation needs us. This city needs us. This area needs us. Nothing wrong with affecting an entire country or the world globally. I truly pray God uses us in such a way, but we have to begin to focus locally as well. You know, one of the things that irritate me, and I don't have a long list. I don't think, do I? She's I mean, like, like everything you do irritates me. So I'm, <laughs> one of the things that irritates me, and there, I don't think there's many, because I feel like I'm pretty cool, calm, and collected. 
So I think of myself. What y'all think, something different. But there's one thing that really gets me upset. And maybe you've experienced this. If I go to a store, a restaurant, where I'm buying something, and I'm at the cash register, and I walk up to the cash register, and I'm like, hey, I would like to buy this. They take it, they scan it, and they say, okay, it's gonna be $12.98. I start to take out my card or my cash to pay for it. Ring, ring, ring. They pick up the phone, and I'm standing here like, I just wanna pay for this thing and leave. And they get on the phone like, hi, this is blah, 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 can I help you? Okay, so you want 25 pounds of brisket and you want four quarts of corn and four uh, whatever, a mashed potato, you want all these things, okay? Give me just a second, let me see if we have that in stock. <laughs> all this time I'm there like, just take my money so I can leave, okay? Oh, you need a discount because you're ordering bulk, let me go talk to the manager. And I'm still staying there, have you ever experienced this? where they're taking care of the person on the phone instead of taking care of the person standing directly in front of them. Yes, exactly. Because they know you're already there, picked out what you wanted, and you're ready to pay so they can put you on hold while they take care of somebody else that they potentially might be. But that's not the way it should be. We should never take for granted the souls of the people in this city. They are directly in front of us for a reason. Some of them desire to hear the word of the Lord over their life. Some of them don't want to hear it. But either way, they're standing directly in front of us. And I believe that God is looking down and he's saying, look, handle the people directly in front of you. And stop picking up the phone and talking to Africa. Stop picking up the phone and talking to Mexico. Stop picking up the phone and talking to China. Stop picking up the phone and talking to Portugal. Start talking to the people in Sealy, Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, not every pastor will say this, but I know that God begins to move within a city. And then others begin to flock to that city. And then others come to hear the word of the Lord from that city. We have to get to the place where we care about the people in front of us. It doesn't make sense in our modern day society because we can be at dinner with our family and friends and be more worried about what other people are doing on social media than actually the people directly in front of us. I see people doing this all of the time. I see a husband and a wife sitting at a table alone and both of them are scrolling on their phones. And me and my wife were at IHOP a couple of uh, months ago and we were sitting directly across from these two people. They were a little bit older than us and they were both just scrolling those thumbs were on fire boy i saw smoke coming off of their thumbs as they were scrolling through facebook and instagram they never said one word to each other this is the only thing i heard him say for the entire 30 minutes we read ihop you ready to go that's all i heard not who's going to pay the bill they had somebody had already taken out a card and paid for it but they didn't talk to each other oh how much love did they miss out on? How much joy did they miss out on? How much conversation time did they miss out on? And sure, they're probably going to go back to their cars, drive somewhere else, and get right back on the phone. We have to get back to entertaining those people who are directly in front of us. Social media is wonderful to push things like the church and the ministry and messages and things like this, but it is so hindering the families of America because we are going insane trying to keep up with everything that doesn't even pertain to us while we lose focus on the very things that we are involved in. And that's just the reality of it. And we're all at fault for it. I post about the church all the time. But then there are times whenever this little brain clicks and the light bulb goes off and it's like, hey, you got to put that stuff down. Or your kids are sitting directly in front of you and they want to throw the football. They want to go play and build forts. They want to do something with daddy. And if daddy's always on social media, they're going to grow up and try to figure this thing out on their own because daddy was absent even though he was present. We have to get back to attending to those who are directly in front of us. Now, I know if we're all having a full day dinner together that people are going to get phone calls. I'm not saying that you never can take a phone call. I'm saying in these moments of influence that you have people in front of you ready and willing to receive, or maybe even ready but not willing to receive, you have to focus in on them. This can be very, very evident if we just look at Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night as we began to preach uh, Bishop 
Tim, Dr. Wendell, and myself, Friday night I stood before you and I said, this message is for Restoration Church. As the pastor of this church, this message is for Restoration Church. And if you're here and you're not a part of Restoration Church, you can learn from it, and I'm glad that you're here. And you're around a body of believers who loves you and cares for you. So grab whatever it is that God has for you as I preach to Restoration Church. And out of it, four people who've never been to this church said yes to Jesus Christ. Because we focus on the people who were there. We have to focus on those who are there. The nation in front of us should be the ones who are affected by what God is birthing within us. The nation directly in front of us should be the ones who are affected by what God is birthing on the inside of us. These last three days, we put our best foot forward and we prepared and we went out there. And I pray that every night blessed each and every one of you. And what we did was we went before the people who are in front of us. Just a couple of blocks from this building proclaiming the name of Jesus. Back in our text, the Bible, Rebecca had a battle going on inside of her as Jacob and Esau were wrestling one another in the womb. And any time that you are about to birth a nation out of you, there is going to be struggles within you. Did you hear what I just said? Any time that you are about to birth something great out of you, there's going to be a struggle within you. So that struggle that you have been going through, that you are feeling, is actually preparation for the release that God is about to bring to your life. We often sit to, we often have a storm visit our life, and we often have hard times come upon us, and we immediately say, no, this must be the devil. But there are times where God will allow some wrestling in our life to propel us to be victorious whenever that which he has put in us is birthed out of us. Because what is in us is greater than the battle that is going on inside of us. And oftentimes we get limited because we focus on the battle and the wrestling. And Rebecca did this too because she even questioned God about it. If you're really birthing something great in me, why is there a wrestling going on on the inside of me? But God was literally setting up something that would change history forever right there on the inside of her so anytime that God is going to birth something great out of you there's going to be a wrestling on the inside of you and we have to get to the place to where we can endure that which is happening in us so that God can get something through us second Timothy chapter number four if you'll have a Bible you can turn there second Timothy chapter number four verses number one through eight. For the second time, I'm going to keep reading. You can write it down. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 8, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. That's what we have to do. Preach the word. Where? Right here. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That that being uh, instant in season and out of season speaks to what we put in us is going to come out of us. So even when things are not happening and we're not standing in front of the people, we must be very careful what we are allowing within us. In verse 3, for the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, I think that we're actually there. But after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and at the time of my departure is at hand. Verse number 7, Timothy says, I have fought a good fight. You see, whenever God is birthing something great out of you, there's going to be a fight within you. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day. And not only to me, did you hear he said, I'm getting a crown, but it's not just me who's getting it. I kept the faith. I fought the fight. I've endured to the end, and I will receive what is mine. But it wasn't all about me. For the Bible says, unto all them also that love his appearance. Every person who said yes because I told them about Jesus. Every person who came and received Jesus because they saw him inside of me. Every time I was the light of the world and it lit up the darkness in their life and they said yes to Jesus, they're going to receive something as well. Why did I have to fight a fight? Why did I have to go through a struggle? Why did I have to keep the faith? Why did I have to go through the battles? Why did turmoil have to go on on the inside of me all of the time? Why did I have to hold out and continue to press to finish to the end? Not just so I can get the crown, but so that you can get the crown as well. So that everybody you give it to can get it as well. That's what verse 8 says, but unto all them also that love his appearing. See, what is in you begins to affect others. We begin to talk about Jacob, and if you read Genesis chapter 29 through Genesis chapter number 41, that's a lot of chapters, but I encourage you to read it this week. Jacob births 13 sons. We only hear about 12, but he actually births, he has 12 sons and adopts one, and here are the names of them if you read out the scripture. Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, and Manasseh. And let me just tell you what each one of them mean for just a second. Reuben means the Lord hath loved, I'm sorry, looked upon my affliction. Simeon means the Lord hath heard I was hated. Levi means that my husband be joined unto me. Judah means praise the Lord. Dan means God hath judged me. Naphtali means I have prevailed. Gad means a troop cometh. Asher means blessed. Issachar means God hath given me. Zebulun means my husband shall dwell with me. Joseph means the Lord shall add. Benjamin means the son of the right hand. And Manasseh means God hath made me forget all my toils. I didn't have to go look this up in the Greek or Hebrew. If you read Genesis chapter 29 through 41, it actually tells you what it means directly after pronouncing the name of each son. Now listen to me. I'm about to close. We're going to go through these names here in just uh, a different order in a second. But I have to remind you that as we think about the 13 sons that Jacob had, we have to get back to the very beginning of what I laid out at the beginning of this message. That what God is birthing in you is larger than what you think. Isaiah chapter number 54 verse 5 tells us that God is Israel's husband. God is Israel's husband. What does this mean? That means that Israel begins to have access to whatever God has access to. For Israel has entered into a covenant with God himself. Understand that when you say yes to Jesus Christ, you become an heir and a joint heir. An heir to God and a joint heir to Jesus Christ, his son. That means that you have full access. Come here, baby. When I married this beautiful woman of my dreams that I love so much, when I married her, what was hers became mine and what was mine became hers. There was no, hey, that's off limits. Don't touch that. And if we tried to do that, it ended up in an argument, and the result was it became hers or it became mine anyway. Because whenever you unite yourself together and you enter into a marriage covenant, the walls are supposed to come down, the boundaries are supposed to come down, and then you are supposed to unify yourself together and say, look, my victories are your victories, my defeats are your defeats, my struggles are your struggles, and we're going to get through it together. You say, I lost my job. That doesn't mean that that she, she's going through the blessing, but the most, most blessed time of her life while you struggle. No, if you lose your job, both of you all begin to struggle. Both of you all begin to pray for 
God to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Both of you go before God because it affects both of you. There is a covenant whenever you enter into a marriage. Now, if Israel is married to God, that means there is a covenant that releases what is God's into Israel. Now, understand this. Today, because of Jesus Christ, you have become Israel. Yes. You have become married to God through his son, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What is his is now yours. So why are you worrying about it? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And you're worried about where your next cheeseburger is going to come from. Just stop <laughs> worrying and start realizing whose you are. Realize that you are a child of the king. Realize that his royal blood is now pumping through your veins. And every time that struggle or that turmoil begins to rise up on the inside of you. And you feel like you can't move forward. Understand you are still in a covenant. And his covenant has released things into your life that you can't buy. That you can't work up. That you can't can't get on your own without him but it's only by him who you can do these things not by power not by might but by my spirit says the lord but when you are in covenant with him you have the holy spirit on the inside of you so we have to thank you baby you have to get to the place where you understand that you're not just a sinner saved by grace that you're not just an old alcoholic who's been sober for four and a half years, but you are completely turned around. You are completely changed. You are completely renewed. The Bible says, create in me a new heart, a clean heart. Renew a right spirit on the inside of me. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's get to the place where we understand that we are not only loved by him, that we are not only rescued by him, but we are also empowered by him because we are in a relationship with him. We are in a marriage with God through Jesus Christ. This means that Israel has all of the resources, benefits, and power that God Almighty has. That's why he tells you when the mountain rises up for you to speak to it. Not on your behalf, but on his behalf, because you're married to him, and you obtain the very same power that he does. So you speak to the mountain, and it says, be thou, when you say, be thou removed, and it must listen to you. So Israel receives the very thing that God has. And remember, when you receive Jesus Christ, that you get the same things as well, because you have entered into a marriage with him. Now, I'm going to close by going through these names of the 13 children of Jacob once again, but I want to take you to the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation chapter number 7. Revelation chapter number 7. So if you have been listening or taking notes, the first thing we started off with was Genesis. And now we're ending in Revelation. Preach the entire Bible in 20 minutes. Genesis to Revelation. But it's amazing to me how Genesis talks about these sons, but then Revelation also speaks about these sons. That means there's something very, very important here. The difference is Genesis talks about them in their birth order. This one was born first, this one was born second, and so on and so forth. We just went through them, and it lays out what their names mean, and we just went through that as well. But Revelation chapter number 7 switches it up and changes the order in which they are listed. Look at what this says in Revelation chapter number 7, verses 4 through 8. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Didn't I say that thing which is in you is larger than what you thought it would be? You thought you were birthing one, and you now have 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were also sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph 
were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Who's got a Bible in front of them? Was it open to this actual? You do? How many names are listed there? Oh, how many names? How many names? Twelve. Twelve, not thirteen. Genesis tells us there's thirteen. Revelation chapter seven tells us there's twelve. If you will remember, I gave you thirteen different names. But here there are only twelve. For the Bible begins to show us that one has been omitted. The one that was omitted was Dan. Can't find Dan in Revelation chapter number 7. Why? If you remember the names and the meanings of the names, you will remember what I had just said was that Dan means that God hath judged. Why is Dan not in Revelation chapter number 7, but yet he's in Genesis? We have to understand that this is twofold. First, because God's judgment is very final. When God speaks the thing, it shall be established. He does not fall back upon his word, for he does not lie like a man lies. When he speaks, he does not waste his words. So when he judges, his judgment is final. But secondly, Genesis is before Jesus. Revelation is after Jesus. Jesus came into the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The very next verse, for he came into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Jesus came in here so that you would not have to be judged. He came in here so that you could be, uh, uh, you could have the verdict of not guilty upon your life. Because whenever you stand before God on the day, uh, whenever you die or you get raptured from this earth, you're going to stand before him and hear one of two things. Either depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you, or enter in, thou good and faithful servant. How do you hear, enter in, thou good and faithful servant? You say yes to Jesus while you're here on this earth. This is the day of salvation, the Bible says. This is the opportunity when you have the, the ability to say yes to Jesus. For there is coming a time, and if you die and go to hell, you can no longer say yes to Jesus and get out of that horrible place. So as you say yes to Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, the judge has already made the verdict not guilty. So therefore, in the book of Revelation, he does not have to mention Dan's name because Dan means that God hath judged. And if you are born again and know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the judge has already stamped you with not guilty on your life. So... Revelation chapter number 7 switches up the order in which they are placed, and it does this for a specific reason. And if we would learn to slow down and read the Bible instead of just pacing through it at an all-time fast rate, we would actually see that God is trying to tell us something deeper. So when we look at the book of Revelation and the names of these the, the different sons, and we see them in the order that the book of Revelation puts them in, we see this. Judah is first, Reuben is second, Gad is third, Asher is four, or fourth, Naphtali is next, Manasseh next, Simeon next, Levi next, Issachar next, Zebulun, Joseph, and then Benjamin. Here's what the meanings of those are. I didn't switch the meanings. They're the same meanings. But here they are in this order. Judah, praise the Lord. Reuben, the Lord looked upon my affliction. Gad, a troop cometh. Asher, I am blessed. Naphtali, I have prevailed. Manasseh, God hath made me forget all my toil. Simeon, the Lord heard I was hated. Levi, God joined with me. Issachar, God hath given me. Zebulun, God hath dwelt with me. Joseph, the Lord shall add. Benjamin, the son of the right hand. Listen to this. When I take the names out of it and just simply read the meanings of their names, it sounds like a testimony that you and I can share to this sin-sickened world. It says, praise the Lord, for he has looked upon my affliction. A troop has come in, and I am blessed. I have prevailed. God hath made, made, made me forget all of my toils. The Lord heard that I was hated, so he joined with me. God hath given me. God hath dwelt with me. The Lord hath added unto me, and the son of the right hand is with me. Who is the son at the right hand? It is our Savior, Jesus Christ, for he sits at the right hand of the Father. When we 
we stand up and testify. This is exactly what it sounds like. I was a drug addict in the street with a needle in my arm. I was a man full of lust laying in every bed that I shouldn't have been laying in. I was a man who was full of lies and corruption and pride. I was a man who was a cheater, a liar, a thief. I was a murderer. Whatever your story is here today, understand that it all started whenever you praise the Lord. How do you praise the Lord? You realize that you have a need and you say yes to him. Or then you're giving him praise as he begins to do things in your life. Why do you praise him? Because he looked upon your affliction. How did you realize that he looked upon your affliction? Because there was a troop in Sealy, Texas that went to the nation of Sealy, Texas to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they came, you realized that you were above and not beneath and that God cared for you. So you became blessed. And once you received the blessing, you prevailed. And when you prevailed, God did something on the inside of you that made you forget all about the stuff in the past. Forget all about the lovers in the past. Forget about all the drugs in the past. Forget about all the depression and heartaches in your past. For he has caused you to forget all of your toil and the struggles that you went through because the Lord heard that you were struggling. He heard that you were hated. He heard that you were alone. So he did not leave you nor forsake you. But instead, he joined himself with you. He began to pour into you and give unto you. And when he was giving into you, he began to dwell with you. And he began to add things unto you. And then you live out the rest of your life realizing that if it had not been for the Lord, if it had not been for Jesus Christ, if it had not been for the one who was sitting on the right hand of the Father, I would be lost. I would still be struggling. I would still be in my turmoil. I would still be toiling with the affairs of this world. I would still be bound by chains. But I've been set free. I want to end you with this scripture. Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter number <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 10 verses 10, 11, and 12 says this by the which we are by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take sin away the sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. Church, the whole cry this morning is that we're not who we used to be. We are not who we used to be. God has birthed something out of us that is bigger than what we thought it was. He has come in and he has eliminated the judgment of guilty off of our life and he has rendered us not guilty and he has come in and did all of the things that Revelation begins to point out in that order. Every single time that the enemy tries to attack you, I want you to go back to Revelation chapter number 7 and go through that same exact process. Praise the Lord. Let him look upon your affliction. Allow others to come in. Allow God to bless you and cause you to prevail. Help him to take away the remembrances of your toil. Remember that he knows whenever you're going through things and you feel like you're all alone and hated and he will join himself with you. For he has been given to you and he is giving to you. That means that he is dwelling with you. He is adding unto you. And that Jesus is still alive. He's at the right hand of the Father. And he loves you. This morning, I don't know what battles you're facing. I don't know what circumstances you have been faced with this week. I know for some of us it could just simply be tiredness because we've given everything we've had Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even yesterday for our E2 school students. 
And we've had church five days in a row. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. So some of us, it can just be tired of some weakness. But we're still going to praise the Lord. We're still going to go right back and go through this process daily in our life. Because every day something's going to rise up. Every day the enemy's going to try and attack. Every day there's going to be turmoil on the inside of you. And as these things rise up, understand it's for a reason. Because God is birthing something huge out of you. He loves you. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person who is here. Father, if they are struggling through things in their life right now, if they feel like their back is against the wall, I pray that this message reminded them that they are the very apple of your eye, Father. Lord, I pray that it reminded the believer who is here this morning going through some difficulties in life that they have the very resources that you have as well, for they have been married to you through your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we lay hands upon ourselves this morning. And if you're here, I want you to do that right now. I want you to lay your hand upon yourself and to de begin to declare the word of the Lord over you. That, that doesn't have to just simply be my job. There's a place and a time for that. But there's also a place and a time where you are reminded that what is God is yours. And you put your hand upon yourself. And you say, pain be gone because Jesus has paid the price. By his stripes I am healed. Mind, settle down and do not worry any longer. For even the birds in the air don't worry about what they're going to eat. So I'm just going to keep moving forward trusting that he shall provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory. You need to just lay your hands on yourself sometimes and be like David and encourage yourself in the Lord and realize that you are still in the marriage. If you are a believer, then you are called to lead and you must understand that he has given you the ability to do so because he has given you what is his. When I'm going through some times, some difficult times, I grab my wife's hand and we pray through it together. She prays for me. She begins to let my faith be built once again off of her faith because she's not sitting back there saying, yeah, I knew you would struggle. And God's not standing back saying, yeah, I knew you were going to struggle. God's saying, look, in your times of weakness, that's when I am strong. Whenever you are weak, I am strong. Whenever you need rest, I can give you rest. Whenever you feel like you are hated and everybody is against you, I'm for you. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 We love you. We thank you. I pray that this blessed you. I pray that these last three days was an incredible eye-opening experience of how God can move within the nation of Sealy, Texas. God's not done yet. So we are going to move forward and we're going to get outside the four walls and we're going to praise him out there just like we praise him in here. We're going to go out there and share the word of God, just like we do in here, because the gospel for us here is an equipping center. For us out there, it is an empowering opportunity for this community. And we cannot be defined as the church on the corner. We have to be defined as the kingdom of God advancing in the city of Texas. We bless your name and we thank you. Church,